So after six seconds, I decided to specialize. The book I've written, it's all done, is called Last Second in Dallas. And I don't have a publisher and I don't have an agent. So if there are any agents or publishers, come see me. All right. Okay. Next, Keith. Got a lot to do today. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Anybody who chooses to start a talk on the Kennedy assassination with lines from T.S. Eliot <laughs> requires some explanation. I want to claim that after 50 years, we are finally returned to the basic evidence in the case and to what our own eyes told us about that evidence. The aim of this whole talk today is to return us to where we started and to know the place for the first time. Well, where is that place? Where is it that we started? For me, the start came on a Wednesday morning in July 1966 when Vince Salandria and I were plodding down Pennsylvania Avenue on our way to the National Archives building. I was carrying a clunky old carousel slide projector and it was getting heavy. By 11 a.m., the heat was already oppressive and not only in the street, but also in the reading room of the National Archives. Marion Johnson came, and we followed him down long corridors to the audiovisual rooms set aside for showing film and slides. At that time, that was the only way you could get to see the Zapruder film. Vince had called up the archives and made an appointment, and hence we could see the film. So we drove down from Philadelphia and got to the archives. The lights were dimmed, and Johnson started the projector. This is what we saw. Okay. At frame 313, when President Kennedy was struck in the head, there was, as there always is, an audible intake of breath. It looked to me as it has looked ever since. It looked like JFK had been hit in his right temple with a baseball bat. He's bowled over to the left rear, his head leading the movement, his right shoulder and elbow elevated, his whole body thrown violently against the upright seat to bounce forward and then crumple in his wife's lap. 46 years later, I'm here to tell you that what my eyes and your eyes tell us about these few frames of film is undeniably correct. John Kennedy was not struck with a baseball bat at that moment, but he was hit with a bullet a bullet from the right front. After all the attempts at telling us something else, attempts at explaining to us what we see here as due to a shot from the rear, after all these attempts, whether called the jet effect theory or the neuromuscular reaction theory, after all these attempts have been studied and rejected for good reason, we are returned to what our eyes tell us and have told us from the very beginning. This talk today is about how and why this is the case. On the screen now is the Pruder frame 313. Remember that old clunky Kodak carousel projector that I 
had lugged down Pennsylvania Avenue. I was doing that at Vince Salandria's insistence because of something we wanted to test about the Zapruder film. Vince had heard from Ray Marcus in Los Angeles a remarkable fact. Marcus told Salandria that if you compared Zapruder frame 312 with Zapruder frame 313, you could see something invisible when the film is run at speed. JFK's head moved forward several inches between those two frames. I brought along the projector so that we could project the two frames on a screen right after each other and see if there was any movement. Marion Johnson loaded up the archive slide projector and finally we were permitted to perform our experiment, frame 312 in one and frame 313 in the other. We flipped between them and this is what we saw. Marcus was right. JFK's head did jump forward between those two frames. It was undeniable. On the drive back to Philadelphia that night, we talked about it. Cruising along the Maryland Parkway in the early evening as the heat began to break, we talked about it. It was there, it was undeniable. Between 312 and 313, JFK's head jogged forward several inches. The explosion we see in 313 had to be the exit of the bullet that had just hit him in the rear of the head and blasted it forward all in less than an eighteenth of a second. Well, within three months of riding back to Philadelphia that hot July night, I'd been hired by Life magazine as a consultant on the Kennedy assassination. This meant I had access to their quite remarkable copies of the Zapruder film. I made copies of these copies and used these copies to do what government investigators should have done years before. That is, measure the movement of JFK's head between these two frames. Here's what I found. The head moved forward 2.16 inches, just over two inches. I was able then, next slide, to graph this. And what you see is forward is to the right, backward is to the left. You see a forward jog between 312 and 313, and then an enormous left and backward snap of the body and the head. Next slide, please. All these figures can be rearranged into acceleration figures, and what you have is a double movement. What a surprise, forward and backwards. Okay. This double movement within an 18th of a second meant to me that JFK had been, twi had been hit twice in the head, first from the rear and then from the front. What else could it be? Oddly enough, when I looked around, though, I found that the basic evidence in the case concerning the head injury resembled this. In other words, that the evidence around this injury came in packages of two. Not only did JFK's head move forward and then backward, Impact debris from the headshot went forward and backward. Medical evidence showed evidence of a shot from the rear and also a shot from the front. And witness testimony and photo evidence pointed towards a shot from the rear and also a shot from the front. Duality. But now we confront a tremendous irony. All of this latter evidence that came in packages of two was not linked to any particular time in the shooting. We knew only that some impact debris went forward at some time and that some time impact debris also went backward. Likewise for the medical evidence and the other evidence indicating shots from both the front and the rear. It was all there, but it didn't carry with it a tag indicating time. The only part of this evidence package that was linked to a specific time was the two-inch movement of JFK's head between 312 and 313. Occurring as it did in the split second between these two frames, it meant and it had to mean that 
JFK had been hit twice. It was the discovery of the two-inch movement that opened my eyes to see all the other instances of dual package evidence. But the two-inch movement, as we shall see, has turned out to be an optical illusion. JFK's head did not move forward over two inches between frames 312 and 313. The movement of Zapruder's camera in 313 produced a blur that I mistakenly read as movement of JFK's head. Yet for over 40 years, this mistaken measurement, this two inch jog forward, has been accepted by everyone, by defenders of the Warren Commission report, by critics of the Warren report, and by bystanders. Everybody has accepted this as a fundamental fact of the assassination. And this two inch movement has an amazing position, logical, logical position in the makeup of the case. If you pull this piece out, everything changes. And that I'll show you today. The only plausible way to combine that forward jog of two inches with the much more massive left backward snap of the head and body was to suppose a, virtual, a virtually simultaneous double head. There were problems with this idea that came to mind, my mind, even then. What were the chances in such a shooting that two bullets would arrive on target in one or at the most two eighteenths of a second? Even more to the point, we were talking about two impacts on JFK's head, but only one that is the explosion at 313, only one was visible on the Zapruder film. Two impacts, but you can only see one. The notion of a simultaneous double hit, therefore, immediately was vulnerable to attack. Since the explosion at 313 had to be the exit of the bullet, causing the two-inch forward movement, if one could explain the left backward snap as following from the same shot, the double movement would be explained as the consequence of a single shot from the rear, and we are all back in the happy company of the Warren Commission. Well, enter Louis Alvarez, Nobel laureate and distinguished professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley. Alvarez first gained national attention with respect to the Kennedy assassination when he appeared in June 1997 as part of the CBS Reports Defense of the Warren Report. He appeared in a cameo role backing a theory that blurs in the film could be correlated with shots. He pointed out that the upshot of his work, quote, was there were indeed three shots fired, just as the commission said. Due to his appearance on the program, I uh, had correspondence with him wherein he said, quote, he was quite pleased, his underlining, that his efforts, quote, have done the most to persuade the public that assassination critics are a bunch of nuts and that the Warren Commission is essentially correct. He went on to say that he was happy to play the role of helping to restore some sanity to the American public. Within a couple of weeks of this exchange with Alvarez, Alvarez set to work on his jet effect theory, his effort to show that the left backward snap of JFK's head was due to the momentum transfer effects of a bullet fired from the rear. But he waited a long time to publish anything on this, but he did. In 1976, he published his theory in the American Journal of Physics. And there you see on the screen a melon that has been shot with a 30 6 rifle, and lo and behold, the melon came back towards the rifle. His theory is really remarkably simple. It pointed out that if a bullet struck a human skull and deposited little momentum on the skull when it hit, and it also blew out a lot of material when it left the skull, 
the balance of momentum might fall on the side of the material driven out. If so, in that case, the skull would move back towards the weapon that fired the bullet. Physics, right? We can see it in this illustration. Bullet enters at entry point in red, blows out the large defect in green with fragments going in every direction, and of course, balance of momentum, good lord, the skull would go backwards, right? That's the idea. Well, what happens when you try to empirically test this theory by firing a rifle? Well, the first thing to remember is don't fire the rifle into a human skull. Why? Because a human skull is thick bone, and the back of the head absorbs a lot of forward momentum when struck. Alvarez suggested that melons be shot, because a melon has an outer layer that would be sliced, sliced through like butter, thus reducing almost to zero the forward momentum imparted, right? Simple. Well, you can read on the screen there, right at the bottom, uh, the results of, of uh, Alvarez's tests. He call, also calls them experiments in the article. He calls them here performances, and that's about right. The performances were now more uniform, with six out of seven reinforced melons recoiling in a retrograde motion. Well, yes and no. It is true that on May 31st, 1970, only melons were shot and six out of seven recoiled in some fashion or other. But what Alvarez never told his reader was that there had been two earlier firing tests. Within the last two years, I gained access to the raw notes and photos of all the tests. They tell a different story than Alvarez told in his American Journal of Physics article. The first test was carried out on June 29th, 1969, and at uh, Alvarez's request, melons were shot. And good Lord, they did just what Alvarez said they would do. They came backwards. But coconuts with jello filling were also shot, and they went 39 feet downrange. A plastic jug with jello was shot. It was blown forward. An 11 pound watermelon was shot, and God knows what happened to it. I guess it just blew up. A plastic jug with water was blown forward six feet. Well, so in February 15th, the firing tests were run all over again. Five rubber balls filled with gelatin, they're blown forward. Five plastic bottles with water. Back to the earlier slide, please. Five plastic bottles with water exploded. Then a tape pineapple. The tape pineapple was shattered with the largest piece going perpendicular to the bullet's pass. Next, next slide, please. OK. Now, here are two photos that show what happened pre-shoot and post-shoot when a rubber ball filled with gelatin was shot. Notice the direction of the bullet? Yeah, it goes downrange as you'd expect, right? In other words, in these tests, every time they shot anything but a melon, right, it went with the bullet, right? But Alvarez didn't tell anybody that. In fact, I, I never knew these tests, these other tests were performed. I, I learned within the last two years that they were performed, okay. Well, six months later, on, on May 31st of 1970, everybody came together for a final set of shoots. And let's look at that. There we have Louis Alvarez holding the melon, right? And there we have his young second wife and two children. This looks like a family outing on, a, uh, on Memorial Day, right? Rather than a scientific experiment, right? But that's what you have. And, uh, and this is what happened. On that day, next slide, please. Now, the bullets fired in these experiments, in all these experiments, were a 30-06 all lead bullets, that is, dum-dum bullets, right? 
And for some reason, they hand loaded the cartridges and raised the muzzle velocity from 2,800 feet per second to 3,000 feet per second. Why? Who knows? Kennedy's head at the time, it would have been hit by a, a, an Oswald bullet, right? Um, would have had a velocity of about 1,800 feet per second. And it was a military jacketed round, not a dum-dum. And uh, <laughs> the kinetic energy transferred is mb squared. So the difference in velocity between 1,800 feet per second and 3,000 feet per second is absolutely enormous. But that's what they use. Oh, the melons. They were reduced in size. The first test of melons were 4 to 7 pounds. They were now reduced to 1.1 to 3.5 pounds. And they behaved even better. Isn't that something? OK. And there, there, you, see the, there you see the results. Well, the final nail in this coffin of the jet effect theory was driven, by, was driven in by a technician from the Army's Edward Arsenal, who testified before the HSCA in 1978. He testified about experiments performed at Edgewood with skulls. They were filled with a simulant that accurately replicated the interior of a living human brain. Both gelatin and animal fur was draped over the back of each skull to simulate uh, scalp. And finally, Oswald's rifle, the rifle that was found, I mean the rifle that was found on the sixth floor, uh, was fired into each skull using the exact same military jacket ammunition that was found in the weapon on November 22nd. You can't replicate it any more than that. Ten skulls, every one. Each one of those ten skulls went downrange when hit by a bullet. Right? Well, look. I'll let other people characterize the kind of science that Louis Alvarez was practicing here. Over 40 years ago, my dear friend Sylvia Marr pointed out that too much investigation in this case is eminence-based, not evidence-based. And I think that about covers it. OK, back from comic relief to the real work we have to do. Finally, we get to that two-inch forward movement, that troublesome two-inch forward movement that Vince Salandri and I first saw in Washington. For some time, I had come to suspect that measurement. Uh, Art Snyder, a very distinguished physicist with the Stanford Linear Accelerator, told me in the 1990s that the acceleration figures concerning JFK's head made no sense at all. He said that 90% of the momentum of the bullet entering at the rear would have had to have been transferred to the head, and this was obviously impossible. Um, and that meant, of course, that there's something screwy here, right? But I didn't know what was screwy. Uh, the iTech Corporation, in May of 1976, using copies, using the original film, using copies from the original film in 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, uh, with I think six or eight photogrammetrists working on it, using the most cutting edge equipment one could find, finally confirmed my figures, right? There is the iTech study, and note, at 312, 313, his head goes forward approximately 2.3 inches. They had it going forward even more than I had, right? But basically, it's the same. Well, so that's where we are. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what was wrong. Yeah? In the first years of this century, a very bright systems engineer named David Wimp from Eugene, Oregon, showed me with remarkable simplicity how both the iTech Corporation and I had made the same simple, dumb mistake. OK, let's look at frames 312 and 313. Now, two places to look. Looking at 312, the yellow arrow points to <coughs> points of light reflected off the chrome strut that goes over the passenger compartment. The red arrow 
points to a highly exposed part of, jo of John Connolly's forehead, right? Pick those out. Now look an eighteenth of a second later. The points of light have now become horizontal streaks, and the highly um, lit part of John Connolly's forehead has been elongated horizontally. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, Wimp, in his articles, using the Zapruder film, pointed out, and his whole analysis is based upon a fundamental and simple photographic principle. That principle is the following. Since highly exposed areas, that is, bright areas of a film, have a whole lot of energy to them, if the shutter is open and the camera moved, then those highly energized areas will intrude into low energized areas. It's a basic photographic principle. In other words, bright areas intrude into dark areas. And that's what you see here. Uh, Z405 on the left is the lamppost. There is no jiggling or is no blur or movement of the camera. Now, 412 and 414, the next two, have some movement of the camera. And notice how the width of the light pole has shrunk. Finally, in 402, on the right, the movement is overwhelming, and the light post is almost invisible. Well, that's the point. Um, now, Wimp has pointed this out in great detail in his articles on the internet. Uh, here's a graph now, which, sh part, pardon me, the next, <laughs> no. Sorry, let's go back to the one before. I, I'm, I just screwed up. Sorry, okay. So, now, here's the crucial kicker. The measurements were made from the back of Kennedy's head to the, the beginning of the rear strut and also the top of the seat. Notice that what happens in 313 is that that brightly lit strip elongates horizontally just as the points of light became streaks and just as Connolly's forehead elongated horizontally. That's what happened. Only I measured that as an increase in length. That is a movement of Kennedy moving forward, when actually it's just the effects of Zapruder moving his camera. Next slide, please. Now, this in forward is up, backward is down. The solid line represents WIMP's measurements post removing the blur and the green dotted line are my blurred measurements. They're almost identical, they're, they're very, very close. And, and notice, first of all, and what's clear from Wimp's own measurements, is that Kennedy's head moves forward a little bit, even earlier, say, between 310, 311, et cetera. Uh, he, with, between 312 and 313, his measurements indicated that Kennedy's head uh, went, went forward to actually about three quarters of an inch. Now, I'll just show you blicks of here's Wimp's study. This will just give you an idea of how complex the math is on this. That's it. That's number two. Let's go to number three. There's number three, and there's number four. So this. Uh, I don't claim to understand the math, but people who do have told me it's right. <laughs> That's science, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, next slide, please. So the red line is the corrected one. And the point is that all this data is very, very soft data. The iTech Corporation pointed out that because of the resolution of the film, et cetera, 
that plus or minus two tenths of an inch was the closest you could get. So when you're down less than an inch, you're not talking about much data that has much significance anymore. Let's go on to the next. Next slide, Keith, let's go to the, through it right. And next, and ne okay, right there. Now, Louis Alvarez did some good work. He did measure the uh, velocity of the levensine, and as you see, he found that it began to decelerate uh, at about frame 300. Now, what that means is, watch closely the clip from the Zapruder film below. Look first at Kellerman and Greer, right? Through the shooting, right? They seen their heads move forward. They move forward. Look at Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly. Finally, take a look at uh, Mrs. Kennedy. In other words, what's happening here is the car is decelerating. The natural, what naturally happens when a car decelerates is if you're sitting in the car, you go forward, right? You bend at the waist and go forward. Something like that is happening. The car decelerated from 12 miles to, per hour to about eight miles per hour over this period. So what you're getting then, you're getting a number of different factors. You have the blur effect, that's, that's one, right? But at the same time, you have everybody in the limousine are also shifting forward, right? None of these things have anything to do with a bullet, right? So the two-inch movement is then explained by uh, independent changes. Now, the consequence of all this is that there is no longer any solid evidence whatsoever whatsoever that John Kennedy was hit in the head from the rear between 312 and 313. This changes everything. With the jettisoning of the two-inch forward movement, there is no longer any reason to even consider the various theories that seek to explain why a, bo why a body hit by a bullet would move towards the gun firing the bullet. This is a critical, logical consequence of everything above. What I love about this, this is a logical argument. There's no way that Alvarez's jet effect theory attaches because there is no place here. No longer does this event show a body or a body part ever being struck by a bullet and moving towards the shooter. So there's nothing to explain with these theories, right? So none of us care any longer you can believe that the jet effect theory is a fine theory. Fine. It doesn't apply here. That's what's so important. Right? That's what's so important. Okay. This is not the only consequence. I have to admit how I was transfixed by that two-inch movement, because when I saw that two-inch movement, it immediately registered what I'm seeing here has to be the exit of that bullet. That's the only explanation for it, right? So I never look closely at what's right here. Could what we see right here not be the exit of a bullet? And maybe the impact of a bullet? Let's look. Let's look at the. Well, I think it could. The two long arrows point to pieces of bone, but the trajectories of those pieces of bone are much more to the left than they are forward. And then if you take the epicenter of the explosion above the right temple, you'll notice there's a fan, a fan of material that seems to be blown backwards over Jacqueline Kennedy's right shoulder. That material, of course, we know where it went. It went onto the motorcyclist, Hargis and Martin, riding off the left rear of the limousine. And notice also, that other impact debris goes down and forward and rear and forward. The rear vectors, I think, are more important and suggest to me, anyhow, now, that what I'm seeing is clearly not the exit of a bullet, but the impact of a bullet. Next slide, please. If one works on this photo and, and raises the contrast and basically shadow enhances the version 
I think you can see then that you have this fan of material going up over her right shoulder and also another fan of material going down. Okay. Well, um, the acoustic evidence produced by the HSCA, there is the Knoll shot, Shockwave, Elm Street Echoes, Houston Street Echoes, etc. The acoustic evidence made it crystal clear to me that I was wrong. There was no double impact. There's one shot. There's only one shot, as Don Thomas can tell you at that point on the uh, acoustic tapes. Only one shot was fired at frame 13, not two. Now, both Bob Groden, who is here and who's talking to me about this, and the two scientists, Weiss and Ashkenazi, were given the job of synchronizing the Zapruder film with the acoustics evidence. They concluded that the next to last shot, the shot from the Knoll, was fired at frame 13, 313. So what we're seeing there is the impact of that shot. Next, the committee asked its photo panel of experts to pursue the same question. They too pointed out that a match between the acoustics evidence and the Zapruder film was only possible if you matched frame 13 with the next to last shot. Given what we see happening at frame 313, it would appear that this shot from the knoll struck JFK high above the right te temple and drove tangentially upward and rearward. That's the tangential shot that Ken Clark is talking about, throwing blood and brain debris over Mrs. Kennedy's right shoulder onto the motorcyclist to the left rear. With the elimination of the two-inch forward movement as a piece of evidence, the remaining pieces come together with remarkable ease into a single picture. That picture was described to me over 40 years ago by one of the most colorful and reliable witnesses to the shooting, S.M. Skinny Holland. It was cold that November night when Ed Kern and I drove out to Irving, Texas to Holland's home. Holland had a leathery face. Um, next slide, please. A leathery face, the product of too many cigarettes and too many days in the West Texas sun as a supervisor for the railroad. And on that November noon, he was standing on the triple overpass watching the shooting take place uh, as if it were a stage play uh, before his eyes. He's in the uh, oval there. There was a flurry of shots, said Skinny, then a pause, then a couple more. The next to last shot, he said, had a different sound to it. It would be like you're firing a 38 pistol right beside a shotgun, he said. The final shots were not simultaneous, but close together. They wasn't, they wasn't simultaneous, he said. They was boom, boom. In looking at the transcript of this interview, that I did 50, almost 50 years ago. I, I remembered the time when I asked Holland the question. He said, you know, they were simultaneous. Well, that's at the time when I thought there was a double hit that was simultaneous. So I said to Holland, I said to Holland, oh, you mean boom, right? And he said, no, they were boom, boom. And I can remember being disappointed that night in, in his home when he told me that. But he was right. He saw it correctly. I didn't. Like the first flurry, flurry of two or three shots, the final shot came from up Elm Street, he said, where the depository lay. The next to last shot, the one with the different sound, came from near the corner of the stockade fence. And there in the shadows of the fence, he had seen smoke. And I believe you all know, you've all heard of this. Now what's impressive to me about Holland is, this evidence is stale. We've all known about it for 50 years, right? So it tends to get stale. But as an investigator for 35 years, what, what I find compelling about this is, this isn't just a report that Holland gave. He acted on it, right? He hears a shot from near the corner of the fence, he sees smoke and he and his two buddies act on it. They, they jump down off the, off the uh, 
the triple overpass, they climb over a steam pipe and then make their way through this jumble of cars until finally they get over to the corner of the fence. Next slide. Uh, and there, that's what they found. That, that was taken in 1966. And that's where they found footprints, fresh footprints in the mud, and cigarette butts. Now, the next Saturday, this was a Wednesday when Kurt and I interviewed Holland. The next Wednesday, we asked him to come into Dealey Plaza. And he came in on a Saturday. And uh, I didn't tell him why. I just asked him to go stand behind the fence where you found those cigarettes and, the, and those footprints. So he did. And I went and took his picture from Mary Mormon's position, which is very easy to find. Next slide. And there is Holland. You see Holland standing behind the fence? Right? Now let's go to the Mormon film. Next slide. Folks, they're standing at the same place. The anomalous shape along the fence line is right where Holland was standing. And of course, since this was reported in six seconds, 46 years ago, this is not news, right? But this is news. At the end of the HSCA's investigation, um, Weiss and Ashkenazi, the acoustic experts, they were asked to compute the position of the motorcycle on the Knoll shot and also the firing point. This is something you could do. You had 26 different echo patterns. Mathematically, you could do that. So mathematically, they did. And what they found was the following. Next slide. This is an official diagram from the House Select Committee, untouched. I haven't fiddled with it. And note what you see. The position of the unknown gunman. Next slide. So, there we have Skinny Holland standing behind the fence, the anomalous shape along the top of the fence, and unknown gunman as established by completely independent uh, scientific evidence 10 years later. So, what have we shown? Well, I think we've shown that John Kennedy was not hit in the back of the head between 312 and 313. Um, frame 313 now, reveals exactly what we always thought was there. JFK was hit, not with a baseball bat, but with a bullet from the right front. There is, however, folks, one fly in the ointment. An additional part of the evidence package has to be explained, or else the remarkable coming together of everything I've been talking about, everything, uh, comes under deep suspicion. This additional piece of evidence simply has to be explained. And what's that? Next slide, please. OK. The green arrow points to, to damage to the windshield on the interior side. The, uh, the, the orange arrows point to blood sport. The notes, Frazier's notes are in the upper right. He testified in New Orleans that he found impact debris as far forward as the hood ornament on the car. Here are two fragments of a bullet that were found in the front seat. Now, look, you don't have to, you can distrust the medical evidence all you want, but the medical evidence does say, however you place it, that there was a little bullet hole in the back of Kennedy's head. Clearly, this impact debris that we're talking about here and these bullet fragments didn't come from any body shot. They had to come from the headshot. And that's also what the medical evidence fairly unambiguously tell, tells us. Okay. So, if Kennedy got hit in the back of the head, when did this happen? Right? Because he got hit in the head at the back of the head, I just tried to demonstrate that I was wrong when I thought that happened between 312 and 313. But, you have, but I have to explain, or this whole melange of fact and theory that I've been giving you comes apart, right? Well, to pull the rabbit from the hat, I give you my good friend, Keith Fitzgerald. 
who first came up with a solution to this puzzle about 10 years ago. Keith. Six seconds in Dallas. Now, uh, Tink told you that he measured the movement of the president's head, which he, of course, he did with iTech back in 1975. Uh, but Tink did something really important. He measured more frames. If you look here, it's 301 to 330. These are all of the frames that he measured. The focus has always been here, between 312 and 313. But I'd like to redirect your attention to here, these last three frames. We all know what the forward movement was, 2.3 inches. But in actuality, the president's head moves faster. What's that? Look. Okay, the uh, president's head moves faster here than at any other point in the film. Why is that the case? There's no audio here. Get some audio, fellas. It was about halfway down then, I had a shot. And he slumped to the side like this. Then I had another shot or two, I couldn't say well, it was one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything. With this statement, I think he was asking the essential question, which is, at the time the president's head exploded, did he hear one, one shot or two? The evidence tells us that the spacing of the shots weren't evenly spaced. And most of the witnesses agreed that the shots were bunched together. So in this case, Abe Zapruder has lots of company. If you look at this from a statistical standpoint, which we're going to do briefly, this is 65 air witness recollections of the spacings of the shots. There are four categories. Two shots bunched at the beginning and at the end, five of 65. The first two, seven of 65. Evenly spaced, 13 of 65. But those remaining 40 tell you that those last two shots were bunched together. There's another piece of evidence that indicates those final two shots were bunched together that has a history of controversy, which is the acoustics evidence. I'm not going to debate that. I'm going to place it inside the other evidence and see where we go. They tell us that four shots were fired. The committee did, with the third shot coming from the knoll. The actual spacing of those shots were 1.6, 6.0, and 0 0.7 seconds. That is our focus. Okay. The main focus on this acoustics has always been frame 312, the null shot. But again, I'd like to divert your attention to the fourth shot. When did that impact in the limousine? There. When had we seen that before? Here, 10 years earlier, before anyone heard the word acoustics. Now, one other point about the uh, acoustics evidence is the agreement between the blur evidence and the shots. In these final two shots, the committee tells us that Zabruder heard both of them and reacted to both of them at the time he should have. That brings us to a possibility. That is, this possibility, not raised by me, but by the committee itself back in 1979. And that is this, that both shots hit the president in the head, the third and the fourth, but the first shot was from the right front. The fourth shot was from the rear. Now how did, uh, okay, there you go. This is the diagram of the president's head the committee uses to show you the rear head shot, entrance, exit, and the missile path. It was designed for this frame, frame 312. But the possibility today raises the same question about a different frame, seven tenths of a second later. What was the position of his head at that time? right there. So indeed, he could be struck again in the rear of the head or for the first time in the rear of the head. What's occurred here is he's moved back after being shot, strikes the back of the limousine, and then begins to move forward, bringing him back right here seven tenths of a second later. And we can see that happened here. 
When he gets to this point, the committee tells us or gives us a road map, and that is this. Dr. Michael Barden, the chairman of the committee, the Forensic Pathology Committee, uh, noted that the head wound in frame 312 could have been caused by a shot from the knoll, but only if that medical evidence was destroyed by a shot from the rear a fraction of a second later. That would be seven-tenths of a second later. The committee then tells us this. The significance of this is that it could mean that the fatal head wound came from the knoll, not Oswald. And then they tell us where to look. For that bullet to have destroyed that evidence from a shot fired from the right front, it would have to have struck the president when? Here. Now, to cut to the chase, the committee never looked at this sequence of frames. They simply made the conclusion without looking. We will look to see what happens. This would be our frame 312 for the rear headshot, frame 327. What has to occur now is that that wound should change, and it should change dramatically. Here we have a 326, 327, and 328, three frames that basically look identical. Something important happens in frame 328, but you won't recognize that, not yet. But as we look at this wound, they're identical looking. The back of the head's in shadow. The right ear is not visible in any photo, but his face is in profile in the sunshine. The head wound is concentrated in that right front area. Now, for the sake of argument, if the rear headshot has not occurred yet, when that bullet enters the head, penetrates through an exit, this wound should change and change dramatically, and the president should be driven forward and downward. What happens? That's what happens. That is about one third of a second of the time interval. What you're looking at now is a completely different head wound for no apparent reason. The medical evidence tells us that only one shot struck the president in the rear of the head, but it can't tell us when. It can only tell us that it did happen. That brings us to this. Now I'm gonna put this in motion. And what we're looking for is a change in 1 18th of a second in that front portion of his head wound. All right. 328 now begins our process. So the next two frames are gonna be what we see after the point of impact. What we see is a head wound changing for no apparent reason. But this is the moment when the president's head moves the fastest forward at any time in the film. It also is the time that the head wound, for no reason, begins to change dramatically. Now I'll put this in motion and we'll see that happen between 327 and 328. You'll watch that head move. If that is our point of entrance initially from 313, it must now become our point of exit at 328. And it does. That wound changes in a ninth of a second, leading to this, which is frame 333. This then is our last wound between 327 and 335. These are prior to, after. The medical evidence tells us that only two shots struck the president from behind. No shots hit from the front. But one doctor, Dr. Weck, did insist that it was possible a shot to have come from the right front. That is this shot as the president is driven back. As he begins and returns to this position in the, in the limousine, now the second shot, this time from the rear, will drive him forward and downward and destroy the head wound. That all occurred again in less than a third of a second. This possibility was acknowledged by the House Committee, and it was supposed to have been a subject for discussion on that last public hearing that was held. No one ever raised the issue. Now, I have to do this a little quickly for you, but the Warren Commission told us three shots were fired and that one missed. They thought it was less likely the last shot missed because of witnesses who told them such was the case. Illustrative of that is James Alkins, who had an excellent vantage point of the limousine and the president. He recalled that that shot, which hit the president in the rear of the head, was the last shot. And he was certain of it for a very particular reason. This is the picture he took. He was preparing to take his next picture, and something unusual happened that no one knows is in the film, but that he saw. And um, as they got in close to me, 
and I was prepared to make the picture. I had my camera almost at eye level. That's when the president was shot in the head. And uh, I do know that the president was still in an upright position, tilted, favoring Mrs. Kennedy. And at the time that he was struck by this blow to the head, it was so obvious that it came from behind. It had to come from behind because it caused him to bolt forward, dislodging him from this depression in the seat cushion and already favoring Mrs. Kennedy. He automatically fell in that direction. The question is, where was James Alkin standing between frames 327 and 337? It was so the answer to that question is right there. He was literally looking at the president at the time this bullet struck the rear of his head. He didn't take this picture because of what he witnessed. He witnessed the rear headshot to the president. He indicated he was 15 feet away with the limousine almost directly in front of him. That occurs here, not at frame 313. And what he saw occurs between frames 327 and 337. He tells us what the acoustics evidence the blur evidence, the witness evidence, and the film tell us. But he could not have known that. He did in 1967. Uh, this again was a headline. Now I've got one quick point to make and not much time to make it, but I'm gonna do it quickly. And that is, a rear headshot at this time opens with the possibility of one additional wound, which is the right wrist wound of Governor Connolly. The fragments from that headshot give the characteristics of a rear headshot fragment striking his wrist. The doctor who operated on the governor's wrist raised that possibility at that time. That is, the fragment from the rear headshot hits the governor's wrist. Entrance wound was on the back of the wrist. Exit wound was on the front of the wrist, palm side. Entrance wound was bigger than the exit wound, meaning an irregular missile probably caused the wound. All right, this is Governor Connolly in frame 312. I'm gonna put these in motion, and what I want you to concentrate on is the governor's hand and his wrist, and we're gonna watch this as he moves forward in turns. This is Governor Connolly now in frame 327. The back of his hand is now facing something very important, which is, here is President Kennedy's head at frame 327. We will now watch Governor Connolly move that arm and hand into a position that is exactly necessary for it to have been struck by a fragment at that time. Right there. The House Committee, in its report, agreed that this was possible like Dr. Gregory did. But they weren't looking here. This is when the photographic evidence and the medical evidence come together. At this point, when the evidence tells us the last shot fired from the rear should strike the president's head. And with that, we're gonna to go to the film. Now what I've done here, there are three versions with the shots superimposed. Run the film, let it play, and that concludes my presentation. The thing is, one warning, this is extremely graphic, so it's not long, but it is graphic. So let us go. Start at the beginning. Okay, now, the, now we're going to have the, the president and the governor together and separated with one introduction. ...that the fourth shot occurred at the Ruder frame 327 would require a finding. In light of the neutron activation analysis, the ballistics test, and the medical testimony, that both the third and the fourth shot hit President Kennedy in the head.
The last one is, will be the full film. You'll hear all four shots. It's not really a factor, but I want to give you the whole version of it so you can kind of concentrate on the last part. I can't help myself. I had to say something. <laughs> Look, um, think of going up into your attic and you find an old jigsaw puzzle and you start putting the pieces together in the jigsaw puzzle, right? And you throw slave and slave and slave and the, the pieces won't fit together. And finally you figure it out. Man, there's some pieces that don't belong in this puzzle. That's the problem. Well, over time, what's happened in these 50 years is that the evidence, the evidence package got contaminated. <laughs> Various pieces that didn't belong in the puzzle got there. For example, Vincent Gwynn's neutron activation analysis. But I'm here to tell you the big irony of this is that I introduced this stupid piece that doesn't belong here. I introduced this two-inch movement, which has such enormous kind of logical significance, because if you pull it out, all the other pieces begin to shift and bend and then come together. So what I'm trying to, to say is that what Keith and I are trying to present to you here is, as it were, a new pattern. Pattern has been there all along. There hasn't been new evidence in the case. It's been there all along. But this is a new paradigm to try to understand what happened. That's what we've been trying to do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.